<laughs> Dude, never did it. Welcome back to Never Did It. My name is Jake Ziegler, and I'm here with Brad Garoon. We have assigned each other each movie from the last 100 years that we haven't seen, and we're going to get together and talk about them. Today's year is 1963. Brad, why don't you tell me what movie you uh, selected for me this time? Oh, I gave you just the most delightful little movie, the most the cutesy, most delightful little smoosh of a movie called Lilies of the Field. <laughs> uh, this is a Sidney Poitier film, and he, he's just, you just got to love him. I think I watched this movie in honor of his death. He had died pretty recently, actually, within the last two years. Yeah. And I had already seen it in the heat of the night. And this was a movie that got some Oscar buzz when it came out. Not only that, it's the movie he won his Oscar for, which was the first time a black man had ever won an Oscar for acting. Very famous film in that regard, although I bet a lot of you have never heard of it. It's just funny how history works. Mm -hmm. But it's totally worth checking out. It is also a total Oscar movie. It's just about him winding up in a small town and helping a bunch of German nuns build a church and how the town rallies around him. It's it's really cute. It's kind of like the Ted Lasso of its time, actually. I would say. <laughs> That's a great comparison. I didn't actually think of that. And I should have because we just watched it. That just occurred to me. What do you, you think of the movie? Yeah, there's nothing more to it than that. There isn't like a lot of deep, you know, we just covered Solaris recently and some of these other movies where there's really nothing deep going on in the lilies of the field. But man, it's just, it's a delight really from start to finish. I mean, the the characters are just, they're wonderful. And there's not really a bad guy even in the movie. I mean, there's, you know, there's obstacles, I guess, that, that need to be overcome, but there's not like a villain who's out there making things harder for it. Well, the, the head nod kind of makes life harder for him, but in a very cute, kind of funny, endearing sort of way, you know, as they kind of convince him slowly but surely to build this, entire chapel for the sh the chapel chapel i would say the main villain of this film is poitier's own self-doubt as he goes through the process of building this church and then his pride as he doesn't want to be helped by the uh mexicans played by jews <laughs> which is just, hollywood is so weird what a weird um, time that that want to help him build the church with the chapel that he absolutely cannot build by himself yeah i mean look this movie reminded me a lot of green book in that mm -hmm. it's sort of tut tuts the racial issues that are apparent these are german nuns who are asking a black American man to build a chapel for them. And race, like, it's really glossed over. And then in the end, it's Hispanic indentured workers who are who end up helping him. And a very poor, I believe it's like a very poor Mexican community that needs the chapa. Yes. They have a traveling chapel out of, a, like, out of the back of a truck or whatever. Right. That, that comes around and they want to have like a nice actual building where they can go and do their worship. And Sydney, oh. Sydney thinks he can give that to them. Only him. Right. And there's a lot of cute things in the movie. Like he teaches, he teaches them to sing a song mm -hmm. and, we and teach all him English. Of... yeah, he's trying to teach them how to speak English too, a little bit. Right. And there's a really, there's one really hot nun, but that never comes into play in any right. kind of way because yeah. it's the sixties. And also because miscegenation was not going to be a part of this movie. Just mm -mm. they weren't addressing that at all. No. So it reminded me of Green Book in that, and there's a place for these movies. Now, should that place be the top of the Oscars? Probably not. It's mm -hmm. not challenging, this movie. It's not, it's not, but it is heartwarming. And I remember when I watched it, I didn't know anything about it, except that he had won the Oscar for it. And I only knew that because I needed something to watch that was well known from him. I just felt wrapped up in a blanket, which is what I want sometimes. I, I watched Living, the remake of Ikiru. Wonderful. God, I love Ikiru. But when I watched Living in the theater, it's, it's, I had the same feeling, like just wrapped up in a blanket. I watched this. No one who listens to this is going to understand this except for you and maybe Kevin Ford. I watched Shingo Takagi. Wrestle in Dragon Gate again. He has since left Dragon Gate. Go back to Dragon Gate to wrestle Stalker at Chikawa. And watching this comedy match, which is all just Stalker at Chikawa trying to put his finger up Shingo's butt. <laughs> I just felt wrapped up in a blanket because it was familiar. <laughs> and, it, and it actually was very funny. And according to Kevin, who watched that entire show, it was the best match on the show, which is really sad. <laughs> Lily of the Valley did that. Green Book did that. I remember I watched Green Book on New Year's going into 2019 at an ex-girlfriend's apartment thinking like, that was really great. And I didn't, and it, the Oscars hadn't happened yet. Yeah. So the world hadn't turned its back on Green Book, but I can totally understand why people would be pissed at Green Book, especially because it got so much acclaim. It doesn't deserve a bunch of acclaim. It just deserves to be enjoyed by your mom. That's like, that's what that's for. Yeah, it's just a nice movie. And I want to go back to something you said just a minute ago, though, about how like Lilies of the Field isn't how it's not challenging. I mean, it's not now if we watch it in 2023, but would it be challenging for a 1963 audience to just see 
you know, a black actor in a leading role with his name above the title. I mean, that was not common. I actually watched, uh, after I watched Lilies of the Field, I watched the Apple TV documentary, Sydney, that came out late, late last year. And they talked a lot about that and how this was a really big deal for that, like to have his name above the marquee. He was one of the first actors, first black actors who actually was like a name above the marquee attraction. And that in itself was a really big deal. So I'm really glad you brought that up because I wasn't sure. Sometimes I wonder, are we more regressive now than we ever were? about things like just a Black person leading a movie. Now, obviously, we had this Little Mermaid controversy, non-controversy controversy last year. Mm-hmm. But that, at least you could chalk up to people are are really stupid when it comes to things that they're familiar with changing. Like when Black Panther came out, yes, there was backlash to it because people thought it was going to be something that it wasn't. But in general, people aren't mad when Denzel Washington leads a movie. Right. Although sometimes they are now because people are so reactionary. And and it made me wonder, are they more reactionary now than they used to be? But then you come to realize, and Denzel Washington has talked about this, that Sidney Poitier was a huge way paver for him. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that that would be the case. And uh, I'm going to check out that documentary now. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's not terribly long. Um, It does a really good job, you know, kind of putting him in uh, a historical perspective, because, yeah, it's one thing, like, I know, you know, like, I can list off the titles, and I've seen, you know, some of the movies and stuff, but to really put it in a historical perspective of what he meant, and it talks a lot about his relationship with Harry Belafonte, too, who was also, you know, a very prominent Black actor and uh, musician and activist, and and talks about their relationship a lot, which I didn't know a lot about. So, yeah, it's really interesting, and it was a good time for me to watch it right, right after that. But, yeah, what he did for, yeah, actors like, you know, Denzel Washington and, you know, Morgan Freeman pops up in the documentary too and talks about like how black actors were sideshows literally before like you know Sydney and Harry Belafonte came along and that was how they they got work I think it was Morgan Freeman who pointed out like if you weren't funny you didn't work you had to be like a comic relief or uh, like a Hattie McDaniel type of character where they were you know the help sort of thing so it was uh Sydney you know, he'd done the defiant ones with Tony Curtis a couple years before Lilies of the Field and that was kind of his first big thing that he that he broke through with his, was him and Tony Curtis you, know, you had a Jew and a black man leading a movie and being equals and they talk about that in the documentary a lot too. So yeah, really, really fascinating. You know what I was wondering? This might not be the right place for this, but I don't think we have anything with him anywhere else on the list. But do you think Wesley Snipes is underrepresented in the conversation about pioneering Black actors? He came quite a bit later, but Mm -hmm. he led a ton of movies in a time when, what, who else aside from him and Denzel and Eddie were doing that? Yeah, I think he, he definitely gets kind of the, sh- the short end because he again he, he did a lot of different type of things too. I mean, he did you know your typical action movies and he did comedy movies and he did stuff like Blade. You know, before comic book movies were all the rage, he was doing you know doing Blade. And I don't particularly love Blade, any of the three of them, but y- you know it wasn't like now where one out of every four movies has a comic book or graphic novel tie into it. So it was at least kind of different for the time and watching them do, you know, go from major league to, you know, and then white men can't jump like where you would do the comedies and just be super, super funny. And then uh, I remember this is probably movie doesn't probably hold up at all today, but when I was a kid, I thought Passenger 57 was like the coolest movie I had ever seen, you know, and I'm totally afraid to watch it now because it probably is bad. And uh, and then I also remember Money Train with him yeah. and Woody Harrelson, you know, back together doing an action movie. Uh, Jennifer one and Jennifer Lopez's first things right after I think right after Selena. And so like, yeah, so there was that too. And I have, so I remember that. Yeah, I think Wesley Snipes probably a little derated because he disappeared for a while too. He had the Nicolas Cage problem and did the opposite of a Nicolas Cage solution. He also flubbed up his taxes and that's right he got did. in some trouble and rather than do a bunch of movies he i think he just tried I, I don't know i don't know what he did but he fell off the radar but then he comes back for dolomite is my name and he's incredible in that movie. incredible what a great movie what a great i loved him in it so much yeah yeah so yeah i thought maybe it's like seems a little lumping it all together to talk about him in this conversation but i do feel like he's a guy who was doing a lot at a time when other black actors really weren't leading a ton of movies, and he's a huge action star. In perfect example, okay, Carl Weathers in Predator is the poster Arnold Schwarzenegger and Carl Weathers side by side. It's not. Demolition Man, is it Stallone and Wesley Snipes both on that poster, both on that, that VHS cover box? Hell yes, it is, because that's a Stallone and Snipes movie. They promoted him just as much as they did Stallone for that movie. And Stallone was still a big star when Demolition Man came out. It was the same year as Cliffhanger. Can you imagine yeah. Stallone, Cliffhanger and Demolition Man in one year? Oh, yeah. What a great year. I love it. I mean, Demolition Man, Demolition Man way better than Cliffhanger. Cliffhanger is good. I mean, Cliffhanger, Stewie from Family Guy doesn't exist without Cliffhanger. So there's that. He <laughs> They ripped off John Lithgow's voice in that That's movie. Right. <laughs> but Demolition Man, I think, is, in my opinion, 
top 20 action movie of all time. I think it's what I think it's Stallone's best movie and not not including Rocky. I, I think it's way better than not way better, but I do think it's better than Predator. That movie just mixes the comedy and the action and the sci-fi so well. And Snipes is crazy good in that movie. Dude, what a great comparison to make because the meme is of Carl Weathers and Arnold Schwarzenegger shaking hands. Yeah. That's it. You don't what other scene from that movie do you remember Carl Weathers in? I remember him getting his arm shot off. That's it. Just and, the, and the gun just the still arm. firing like when his arms like just, you know, flailing around on the ground. Right. And then you've got Jesse Ventura not admitting but playing his character gay. That's right. I will die on that hill. Wow. But we're talking about the movie Lilies of the Field. <laughs> and somehow we got onto Jesse Ventura being gay and predator. Did Lilies of the Field get nominated for other Oscars aside from Best Actor? Yeah, Oscar-wise for this movie, Sidney Poitier did win. That was the only win that it got, but it was also nominated for Best Picture. The head nun, Lilia Scala, she was nominated in Supporting Actress. The screenplay today called the Best Adapted Screenplay, it was nominated. And then also Best Cinematography in a Black and White Film. What was the category for Adapted Screenplay called back then? It was called Best Writing, Screenplay Based on Material from Another Medium. Just rolls right off the tongue. Yeah, it's, I don't know. How did they not stick with that? I mean, it, it probably fits right on the trophy real nice, too. Yeah. All right, cool. Let's talk about Eight and a Half. Eight and a Half. There's, yeah, that's a movie, huh? Yeah, hell of a movie. Mm-hmm. I've got quite a tale to tell about it, but why don't you first tell me why you recommended it to me? Yeah, well, this was an easy recommendation for me. Fellini, a couple episodes ago, I know we talked about Tarkovsky, the, uh, the, great, the great Russian director, and Fellini is, you know, much in that similar regard, very highly regarded, famous Italian director, made, made you know, just a ton of great movies. La Dolce Vita, La Strada, Eight and a Half, obviously, is one of them. You know, Roger Ebert has called his movies some of the best that are ever made, and he's unique. And he gets referenced in all kinds of movies, directly and indirectly. One of my favorite Fellini references is in one of my favorite movies. Uh, and you, you wouldn't expect to see a Fellini reference in a movie uh, like Role Models. But when uh, Paul Rudd is having the argument with the lady at the coffee shop and she tells him, like, yeah, Venti is 20. He goes, uh, says who, Fellini? Like, <laughs> that's, you know, <laughs> that's just the, the, the last place you'd expect to hear it. But it's even in Role Models. So. Um, and you know, eight and a half, like I said, between like eight and a half, La Dolce Vita, La Strada, I mean, I, you know, could have picked any one of those, you know, the ones that people kind of regard as his best. So again, I thought you would, I thought you would like, and has a lot of historical significance. For sure. Uh, so it's called, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's a meta movie and it might be one of the first meta movies, if not the first, I, this is the only Fellini movie I've seen. I'm going to be watching more now. Yeah. I liked it quite a bit a lot because of things I've watched this year, other movies I've watched this year that are heavily influenced by him. I don't know how how I would have felt about this movie had I watched it last year. That's really interesting. Yeah, I'm about to get more into it, but it's called Eight and a Half because he had made eight and a half films up to this point. Seven Seven and a half half films, yeah. (laughs) Right, which is just wild that that's like not something you expect to happen in the 60s. And the movie is very self-referential. The main character's name is Guido. Actually, we were talking on the last episode about Risky Business. The villain's name is Guido, and here the hero's name is Guido. Yeah. (laughs) He's a filmmaker, and he has creative block. So his production company sends him to a spa, and then they all join him at the spa, and it becomes this surrealist farce where the lines between reality and his dreams get blurred. He thinks a lot about his childhood. He thinks a lot about the women he's been with and the women who are in his life now. His paramour comes to visit him, then his wife comes to visit him, and he has complicated feelings about both of them. He kind of hates the woman he's having an affair with, but he loves his wife, but he's frustrated by his wife, and he doesn't want to be tied down. And his, his fantasies get meshed in with his reality. And it's really interesting. And also the movie he's making sucks. And he knows it too. Yeah. Yeah. He's making this alien movie that's just bad. They're wasting all the money on that gigantic rocket set. And it's just this <laughs> just gigantic edifice to just nothing. Yep. One of the best scenes in the movie is when they go to visit it and his wife has just arrived. This is such an interesting scene. So his wife has just arrived. He's begged her to come see him. She's nervous. They haven't seen each other in a long time. They haven't had a good time together in at least a year, she says. And they go to, he takes her to this rocket. Although before they go, one of the, she's brought a bunch of her friends and her sister who hates him and her best friend who likes him. Mm -hmm. And also this guy who he suspects is in love with his wife. And he keeps pushing this, that this guy's in love with his wife. And you come to realize that he kind of wishes this guy would be in love with his wife so he could feel less guilty about the fact that he's having all these affairs. Because this guy is a loser. In the end, he's twerp. Now, here's where I think it's interesting that I like this movie so much now, and I'm not sure if I would have liked it as much a year ago. In the last few months, I have seen Brazil and Bo is Afraid. And you can draw a direct line from eight and a half through Brazil to Bo is Afraid. And I don't know if you can jump Brazil. 
but you can definitely go through. And I know you've seen Bo's Afraid, and I know you haven't seen Brazil, but you've seen. Yeah, other... I would have to jump Brazil, unfortunately. <laughs> right, but you've seen other Terry Gillum movies. Yeah, and he is clearly so influenced by Fellini's surrealism. Definitely. Um, but Brazil is very similar. Now, what I thought was interesting is when you go from eight and a half to Brazil to Bo is Afraid, the protagonist gets more gets to be more and more of an overt loser. In eight and a half, he's a really well dressed. 40, I think they say he's 45 years old. Good looking guy. I mean, super famous, handsome. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Great hair. Women love him. They want things from him. And he's tortured. And as the as it goes on more and more, you realize like, oh, he's a child. He doesn't know how to be. Yeah. He's like kind of a loser. In Brazil, the main character is a working stiff. Brazil is all about the enemy of, of Brazil's bureaucracy. Whereas the enemy in eight and a half is being a juvenile and, and creative block. The enemy in Brazil is, is bureaucracy and fear. And this guy's like a working stiff, but he has these dreams, just like the dude in eight and a half. He has these dreams of this perfect woman. And in eight and a half, he has these dreams of this perfect woman. And when she finally shows up at the end, she's not what he thought she was. And it doesn't mm-hmm. fix anything. And- Jimmy Jacobs loves Lacey all over again. Oh, yeah. Hey, if you want to watch a good wrestling storyline, Ring of Honor 2007, 2008. Six and six or seven. Yeah. Six and seven. That's that's the Jimmy Jacobs and Lacey stuff. Very some Fellini-esque. I never put that together until just now, but I'm like, oh, yeah, that's eight and a half. That's literally eight and a half. Yeah. Yep. I'd be very curious to know if he's seen eight and a half. I kind of doubt it, but I bet he's seen Brazil. Doubt, but I'm going to maybe suggest it to him. He's, he's, yeah. he'd, probably more, he'd probably be open to it at this point. In Brazil, he he has a good career. His family is connected to the higher ups in this fascistic bureaucratic community that he lives in. He has great connections. He's going to get promoted, but he doesn't want to get promoted because he likes being good at the job he has now. And he has these dreams of this, of this. He's an angel and this w- gorgeous woman is in his dreams. And then he sees her and it turns out she's this like revolutionary. And he can only find out more about her if he gets the promotion. So he takes the promotion so he can do this, but then his life starts tumbling out of control. And then near the end, it's again, you don't know what's real and what's not. And because you haven't seen it, I won't spoil it. But but, yeah, because I do. Um, I do. I mean, that should be on my list. That's high yeah. on my list. Of like, yeah, I should have should have seen that. Anyway, it's interesting. So he's he's like a working loser. And as it goes on, you realize this guy has no idea what he's doing. He seems like kind of with it in the beginning. And then he's just like, what a dork. And then in Bo is afraid. You've got a guy who's just a loser and like gross and really off putting from the beginning. And he's afraid of everything. And he has crazy anxiety. He may or may not be in love with his mother. And this is a theme through all three of these movies in eight and a half. You've got Guido dreaming simultaneously about his mother and all these women that he wants to have sex with. In Brazil, there's a scene where, how can I say this without saying too much? The main character is very confused about whether a woman is the woman he's in love with or his mother. And they use the two actresses very interestingly in that scene to do that. And then in Bo's Afraid, this guy never has sex because his mother told him he'll die. And then... At the end of the movie, when sex finally enters the equation, things get crazy with the woman he has sex with and with his mother. He doesn't have sex with his mother, but just crazy. And I love Bo is Afraid, and I really like Brazil, and I really like Eight and a Half. And just being able to draw this line from Fellini to Gillum to Astor was very cool. And obviously, you have guys like David Lynch, who are clearly very influenced by him. Absolutely. What's his name? The dude who made Southland Tales. That movie sucks, but like at least he took a swing. And uh, it's... Yeah, Dying Darko guy. Yeah. Dying Darko, yeah. You know what I thought of when I was watching it this time? And I don't think I noticed this the uh, first time, but I've also watched somewhat recently, because I watched it, my wife hadn't seen it, I uh, watched Adaptation. And I thought some very there were a lot of similarities to that, too, where, you know, the the Nicolas Cage characters, I guess, you know, are, are having that kind of writer's block sort of thing, you know, and that doubt and all, all, all of that sort of thing creeping in and then you know the movie kind of turns into a surrealistic nightmare of uh you know what is exactly what he didn't want the movie to become so it's i mean it's a little bit different but i do see kind of some parallels there and then you could even even being john malkovich you know earlier spike jones who kind of has that loser character who you know is just having this block and find something you know needs to find something to break out i guess bro it's not spike jones it's charlie kaufman charlie kaufman wrote there we go uh, yeah being john malkovich adaptation along with his brother donald Mm. Eternal Sunshine. And most importantly to this, to add up just really weird surrealist stuff, a movie I don't really like very much, but have to add it to him, Synecdoche, New York. I knew, yeah. There is no Synecdoche, New York without eight and a half. 100%. Wow, Charlie Kaufman, what a weirdo. What a weirdo. My favorite thing about Adaptation is that his brother, Donald, is actually, there's an Oscar nomination for him and he's not a real person. But like, that's an official thing. Like the, the nominees are Charlie and Donald Kaufman for adaptation. <laughs> that's amazing. I really, Anomalisa is like high up on my list because I'm trying to watch all of the stop motion Terrific. features really that I can. Movie. Yeah. Um, And then I'm thinking of ending things I really want to watch too. Really good. What do you think of Confessions of a Dangerous Mind? I remember liking it. Um, I have, probably haven't seen it in a really, really long time, but I remember yeah thinking it was pretty good. 
we were talking about George Clooney on a recent episode. And I think he's a really good director. I've liked, yeah. I mean, I remember Leatherheads being pretty meh. And didn't he direct Men Who Stare at Goats? Good Night and Good Luck is good. Yeah, Good Night and Good Luck is great. Um, yeah, I remember liking Confessions. He did that weird movie where he had a beard and nobody liked it. Oh, yeah. What, Midnight, uh... Midnight Sky? Yeah, and then he did Suburbicon, which also everybody hated. I actually have not seen it. I was I, I was just, I couldn't. You couldn't do it. I didn't want it to be, I just couldn't be disappointed like that. I mean, him and like the Cohen stuff, like I can't do it. Right. And then recently he did The Tender Bar, which I heard is okay. It's very okay. Yeah. Not Men Who Stare at Goats, Monuments Men. That was very medium. There it is. Men Who Stare at Goats also not, not amazing. Not amazing, but it was okay. Yeah. I want to Lee, uh, what's his name? Ewan? Ewan's in that one? Oh yeah, he is. Ewan McGregor and... Uh... They stare at goats. They try to make goats die. Weird movie. Um, But yeah, yeah. Eight and a Half. Crazy stuff. Really liked it. This movie, uh, eight and a Half actually did score a little bit with the Oscars, especially for... Uh, in international film, Fellini was up for Best Director, and he won for the Best Foreign Language Film. It was also up for your favorite category, the Best Original Screenplay, and it also was up for Best Art Direction and Costume Design in the Black and White categories, I would say all of which were very, very deserved. Yeah, it's just terrific. I never, I didn't know what this movie was. Like, I, I've seen it, the poster everywhere. I had mm. no idea what it was. I still don't totally know what it was, but I really, really liked it. And I'm really appreciate it. almost makes up for you recommending Never Say Never Again last week. Not quite, but almost. This was a good one. Good. I'm glad. Yeah, I, I, I felt pretty good about that one. And I'm glad, uh, glad it panned out. Cause, and I'm glad I took the time to watch it again too. I don't think I've seen it since I was in college, which is longer ago than I care to admit. So I'm, yeah, I'm glad I took the time to watch it again. And it's, it feels like a movie that you could be like, very rewatchable, like like yearly or something. You know, I feel like I, I should probably revisit this one a little more often than I have. Totally. All right. Well, that'll do it for 1963. We'll be back with 1943 next week. If you want to know what is coming out next week, go to our Letterbox profile. You can find me at Brad Garoon on Letterbox. I think Jake, you're Jake Ziegler on Letterbox. Yep. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, Jake underscore Ziegler. And both of us have pinned to our profiles, our Never Did It podcast list. You could also just search for the Never Did It podcast list. And the two movies that will be discussed on next week's episode are always at the top of that list. So check that out. And thank you for joining us for Never Did It.